Uncle Billy bankruptcy scandal in prison. We're talking about that today, and I'll, I'll try to tie it all together and, and make it make sense for you. But have you ever had to face the consequences of a problem that you didn't cause? Amen? Uh, if you say no, you've never had a teenager in your house. Or it's been a long time since, and you've kind of forgotten what that was like. Uh, in the Christmas classic, in our series is called It's a Wonderful Life, uh, George Bailey has taken over the building and lawn after his daddy's death, and now, through no fault of his own, this company is in trouble. Uncle Billy's just lost $8,000. Uncle Billy bankruptcy scandal in prison. $8,000 in 1945 had the same value as $114,000 today. So what do you do when the setback isn't your fault? Let's talk about that. I don't like dealing with the consequences of a problem that somebody else has caused for me. Anybody else? I mean, that's bad. It's easier for me to deal with it if it was my fault, right? Now, if you've been deeply hurt by other people, you know what I'm talking about here today. You know what I'm talking about. Maybe you're dealing with a setback from a divorce that you didn't want, or you're paying the price of a bankruptcy that wasn't your fault. Or you're dealing with problems caused by your children. Or you lost a job because the company got bought out. It's not your fault, but you're still having to face the consequences of somebody else's bad decision. Now, I know a lot of people who struggle with their identity, uh, their emotions, their mental and physical health. And this is common because some evil person at some point, maybe early in their life, abused them in some form or fashion. As your pastor... And friend, I'm telling you, I've talked to a lot of people, and I'm very sorry that anything like that could ever happen to anyone, and I can't stand the thought of it. But I want you to, to know there, these are major storms. These are major storms. It's not your fault when somebody else brings those kinds of things into your life. But they can wreak havoc. They can wreak havoc on your health, uh, your hope, and your happiness. Can I get a witness? So today... Let's talk about turning your setback in, into your comeback. All of us have suffered because of the foolish choices of other people. And the Apostle Paul uh, faced a life-threatening storm and a shipwreck because of a bunch of dumb people who made some really stupid decisions. And I want to give you the background on that, and we'll tie it all together before we're done today. But Paul had been accused of a crime that he didn't commit. He, he had done nothing wrong. He finally told his accusers, accusers that he was a, a Roman citizen and they were going to be in trouble if they didn't send him to stand before Caesar because they had no authority over him as a Roman. Uh, so instead of setting Paul free, they decided to send him back to Rome so that he could stand trial there. And most of you know this story, but Paul is waiting to board a ship for Rome on the island of Crete, located in the Mediterranean Sea. Now the crew has been on shore leave of sorts, and now autumn was turning into winter, and winter's not a good time to try to sail in that region. So God speaks to Paul, and he tells him, he said, hey, you need to go to the captain of the ship, the pilot of the ship, and you need to warn him that they need to wait until winter has passed before they set sail. So Paul goes to the captain, and he tells the captain exactly what God has just told him. But the captain and the crew, they didn't want to wait. They kind of were ready to get going. So they set sail in spite of God's warning through Paul, and all hell was about to break loose because the storm of, of epic proportions was on the horizon. Acts 27, 41 says it like this. The ship struck a reef and ran aground. As it was repeatedly smashed by the force of the storm's waves, the ship began to break apart. And this is the story of Paul's shipwreck. So what does this story have to do with you, Uncle Billy, bankruptcy, scandal, in prison? Well, actually, it answers three very important questions that I think are relevant to everybody in the room today. So let's jump right in and unpack this together. Why do people do stupid things that cause problems and setbacks for others? First of all, it happens a lot of times when people listen to ungodly advice. Amen? Y'all okay out there? Y'all look a little bit shell-shocked, and I hadn't even got going good yet. Okay, here we go. Paul warned the sailors with this advice. Fellas, God told me to tell you that our voyage is going to be dis disastrous. And if we sail now, we're going to lose cargo, we'll lose the ship, and likely we're going to lose our own lives also. But the Roman officer in charge of the prisoners didn't listen to Paul. Instead, he followed the advice of the captain and the owner of the ship. Has anyone in the room ever been given bad advice? I think we all have. Have you ever been overruled by an expert? Maybe 
uh, like a doctor. You know, sometimes we say, nobody knows my body better than me, and I know when I'm, you know, something's wrong. Uh, you ever tried to tell a doctor what was wrong with you, but that doctor pushed back a little bit, and he says to you, I don't think that's your problem. We're going to treat something else, and this is going to fix you. And you end up back in that office a few weeks later, and you still haven't gotten better, and you kind of look at the doctor, and you go, I tried to tell you. I tried to tell you what was wrong with me. You wouldn't listen, right? Well, in just a little bit, you're going to hear Paul tell the captain and the crew, look, I tried to tell you guys, but you wouldn't listen. And now your problem is my problem too. And that's why he's going to say, I told you so, right? So listen up, cross pointers. When God tells you not to do something, it's okay at that point in time to ignore all the experts who tell you to do it because they're going to be wrong. They're just going to be wrong. The second reason people make dumb decisions that hurts others, they copy the crowd. They copy the crowd. If you're following along in the app, you can just fill in all the blanks as we go, and you're going to have a great plan to help a whole lot of people if you're, if you're doing that. In other words, when we do what's popular, when we, we go with the flow, when we say, but everybody's doing it, and we find this in verse 12, then the crew decided that they should go ahead and sail up the coast of Crete because the majority, everybody say the majority, the majority wanted to spend the winter in Phoenix, and it had a nice harbor. History affirms the majority is often wrong. The majority is often wrong. For example, Moses sent 12 spies into the land of Israel to see if they could go ahead and conquer that land. Ten of them came back and said, hey, there's giants in the land. We surely can't overtake them. We can't possess this land. But Joshua and Caleb came back and they said, hey, man, we are well able. God is on our side. Let's possess the land. They went with the majority and they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years when they could have reached their destination in 11 days. 14 days max if the majority of them were age 55 or older because they would have had to stop to pee a whole lot more often. <laughs> the experts are often wrong and so is the majority, folks. I mean, that's just a fact. The Bible tells us there were 276 prisoners or people on that ship. So they voted on whether or not to set sail. The vote was 273 to 3. Paul and his two companions uh, voted not to sail. And one of those, we believe, was Luke, who eventually is writing this story and sharing it with us. So the majority decided, let's go ahead, and, and even though Paul's God tells us not to, we're going to sail. And can't you just see Paul shaking his head in disbelief? He knows that their stupid decision is about to cost him some problems in his life, too. He's going, you guys have no idea, but trouble is just around the corner, not just for you, but for me now, because you wouldn't hear what God had to say on the matter. Do you know people, think about it, do you know people that wrecked their life because they copied the crowd? They, they did what was popular. And of course you do. We see it every single day. There's a third reason people do stupid things that hurt others, and here it is. They count on circumstances instead of Christ. They count on circumstances instead of Christ. When a gentle wind began to blow from the south, notice this phrase, the crew thought they had obtained what they wanted. A gentle breeze begins to blow and they think, that's great, we've got what we wanted, let's go. The crew thought they had obtained what they wanted and their plan would work. So they pulled up the anchor and they sailed as close as possible to the shoreline of Crete. Have you ever wanted something so bad? You know what? I learned my lesson first service because nobody gave any affirmation to this. So let me rephrase the question. Have you ever known somebody <laughs> who wanted something so bad and you're in their ear saying, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. But they're not listening to you because, you know, you're saying, you know, uh, that boy's trouble. And she's saying, but he's so pretty. Right? I know how it is. Sometimes what you, you think you have to have is not what you should have, and the path you are on is going to wreck and ruin your life, and the fallout effect is not just going to hurt you, but it's going to hurt everybody in your circle. Your stupid decisions, and, and, you know, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about the person sitting next to you. Your stupid decisions. Your stupid decisions don't just affect you. They affect everybody that loves you. And so we're the recipients of bad decisions of a lot of people. The Scripture says they found a favorable, gentle wind. 
If something looks favorable, but God is saying no, or God is saying not now, or not yet, you're going to sail into a storm of epic proportion. But PT, it, it feels right, so it must be right. Wrong. Well, it feels so good, it must be good. Wrong. That's a quick way to arrive at a wrong conclusion. Never trust your circumstances. Why is that? Because they change constantly. Circumstances change constantly. They often change overnight. And sometimes, as you're about to see, they can change suddenly or immediately. The Bible says in verse 14, But shortly afterward, after they had made the the decision to ignore everything that God had just said, shortly afterward, the weather changed what? And a wind of hurricane force came out of the northeast and blew the ship out to sea. They're they're trying to go up the coast of Crete, and now they're blown out to sea, and they're at the mercy of this storm. Now, don't miss this. This is important. Listening to ungodly advice, copying the crowd and relying on circumstances, thinking stupid thoughts like, if it feels good, it must be good, will throw your life off course every single time. Every single time. So, even if it's not your fault, but you're still dealing with the circumstances, the fallout, the pain, and all that collateral damage of of someone else's stupid actions, listen, folks, you can't conquer the consequences if you don't identify in your life what they are. So, I'm going to walk you through this, and we're going to see where we can get from here. But before that you can fix it, you need to identify it. Are you all okay out there? Are you ready for this? Punch somebody, say, it's going to get good, pay attention. Now, you may not have done it. However, dealing with the consequences of someone else's dumb decision can cost you to drift away from your goal. can cause you to drift away from your goal. The Bible says the ship was caught up in a storm, and the wind was so strong they couldn't sail against it. They lost all control, so they stopped trying. And they gave up, and they let the wind drive them, drifting in every direction. Now, this verse is absolutely packed with with insight here. He says, dealing with the circumstances of someone else's dumb decision can cause you to lose control of your plan. You're, You're not in control anymore. It can cause you to stop trying because you just get tired of fighting the consequences of somebody else's choices. It can cause you to give up. It can cause you to become pressure driven instead of a purpose driven person. He said, we let the wind just blow us wherever. It can cause you to drift. Drifting means that you just simply have no direction in your life. And we all know a lot of people that seem to have no direction in their life. They don't have a plan. They don't have a purpose. Listen, when you're, when you're in a storm, things are going to fall apart, and you need to realize that they can cause you to drift with no clear direction. Second thing, I didn't do it. However, dealing with the consequences of someone else's dumb decisions, number two, can cause you to discard what you used to value. Let's talk about that. In other words, your priorities and values change when you're in pain. Did you know that? Your priorities and values will change when you're in pain. They change after a setback. They'll change after a struggle, especially if you begin to think, am I ever going to get out of this storm? Am I ever going to sail through this troubled time, this season in my life? When you're in pain, some stuff doesn't matter as much, and things you never considered before all of a sudden matter a whole lot. Let me explain that. We rarely think about good health until we have to deal with bad health, right? And then all of a sudden, we're we're just constantly, you know, what can I do? The priorities change. You're going, what can I do to fix this problem? What can I do to get back on the right track? Good health doesn't have as much value until you're dealing with bad health. Keep in mind, this storm's been raging on them for 14 days. Look at what happens next. The next day, as the gale force winds continued to batter the ship, the crew began throwing all the cargo overboard. The following day, they even threw out all the ship's equipment and anything else that they could lay their hands on. Now, I want you to notice the progression here. This is a big deal. First, they threw out the cargo trying to lighten the ship. Then they throw out the equipment that they actually needed to run the ship. Then later, they throw themselves overboard. They're going to jump in the water and try to swim to shore. Now, dealing with problems, whether they're my fault, your fault, whoever's fault, can cause me to drift and cause me to discard things that I once thought were very valuable in my life. We start throwing stuff away, stuff that really you shouldn't be throwing away. Some of that stuff is very valuable. 
And here's what I want to say to you. You've heard some version of this before. But folks, there's a lot of wisdom in what I'm fixing to say to you. And I didn't come up with this. Somebody else did. And I'd credit them if I knew who it was. But I've heard it all my life. But I'll tell you this and I'll stand on it and not back up from it. Never make a major decision when you're depressed or emotionally distraught because it will almost always be the wrong decision. Amen. Me and and Clarence may not be there to bail you out. Just saying. Slow down, okay? Third, I didn't do it. However, the consequences can cause you to lose all hope. They can cause you to lose all hope. The terrible storm raged unabated for many days, the Bible says, blotting out both the sun and the stars until the dark, until in the dark we finally gave up all hope of being saved. Fourteen days of total darkness. No stars, no sun, no compass. They have no idea where they are. They're, they're just lost. They're, they're being tossed back and forth by the waves and the raging sea, and they're starting to think, we're doomed, we're finished. It's over. Stick a fork in us. We're done. They finally lost all hope. Hope is the last thing that most of us give up on. The last thing that we let go of. Now, the amazing part of this story is how different Paul's reaction is to the rest of the crew and the prisoners on this ship. Everybody else is in panic mode, right? But Paul has this incredible peace. Everybody else is cowardly and in despair. But Paul, this guy is confident and he's calm, right? Now, as a pastor now for many years, I've I've watched people react to the crisis, to the storms, to the setbacks in life. And I've discovered that the true test of your faith is not how high you jump when you're singing praises to God, but how straight you walk when you're going through the valley of the shadow of death. How do you react during a storm or during a setback in your life. There are tons, listen, there are tons of fair-weather Christians, Jesus followers in the world today. But remember, this storm is not Paul's fault. He didn't do it. He didn't make the stupid decision. He advised against it. It's Uncle Billy's fault. I'm just seeing if y'all are paying attention, okay? Not Uncle Billy. It's the captain and the crew that decided they took a vote. And everybody that voted against Paul and voted against God's counsel. So George Bailey nor the Apostle Paul, these boys hadn't done anything wrong in either story. So Paul warned the captain and the crew. He said, hey, God says if we take off now, we're going to sail right into a storm. We're going to be in a shipwreck. But they ignored what God had told them and ignored what Paul was telling them that God said. But Paul is still filled with hope, man. He's just full of hope, even in these days of total darkness. What is this guy's secret? I mean, it's just incredible how he continues to look forward. Well, when you face a setback or you face a storm because of somebody else's dumb choices, then you need to to remember the same things that the Apostle Paul remembered. And I'll walk you through this. What should I remember? First of all, and this sounds so simple, but you need to remember that God is with you. Man, you need to remember that God is with you. God hasn't abandoned you. He didn't abandon Paul, and he won't abandon you either. No matter how dark it may seem, God is with you. Look at somebody and tell them God is with you. And you may think that's just rhetorical, but so help me, there are people that forget that God is with them. And they try to manage all of this mess on their own. Paul called the crew together. Now, remember, they've been in this storm for 14 days, can't see the sun, the moon, or the stars. All hope is now lost. So finally, Paul called the crew together and told them, Men, if you had listened to me, this was his moment. (laughs) Right? Y'all brought this mess into my life, Paul said. So he gets to say, if y'all had listened to me, I told you so. We wouldn't be in this trouble we're in. So according to Paul, sometimes it's okay for you to say that. But you got to be careful when and how, right? (laughs) You would have avoided all this injury and all this loss, Paul said. And here's the positive side of this message. Watch this. He said, but take courage. None of you will lose your lives even though this ship's going down. That's not what we wanted to hear you say, Paul. He says, oh, no, it's going down. There's going to be a shipwreck. He says, for last night an angel of God, of the God I serve and belong to, stood by me. Now, you can't see God with your eyes, but listen up, folks. Right now, God is standing by you. 
God is standing by you because God is omnipresent. And that means that he can be everywhere at the same time. Now, I don't know what you're going through right now as you hear me saying these words, but I do know this. Without quarter or compromise, my God is present. He is with you. You hear me? He is with you. You say, well, I don't feel him. It has nothing to do with your feelings. It has nothing to do with your feelings. It has has everything to do with the reality and the truth that God says, I will always be with you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. God cannot, he will not break that promise. Amen. Number two, remember God's purpose is greater than your storm. And this is where we struggle. Let's be honest about it. God's purpose for my life is greater than any storm or setback that I'll ever go through. And while that should give us hope, sometimes we don't like the way that that plays out. God's angel said to me, don't be afraid, Paul, for you will certainly stand before Caesar. God says, don't be afraid, Paul. You will. Not you might. You will certainly stand trial before Caesar. Now, why was that a blessing? He was about to go stand before the emperor of Rome and be tried and probably convicted. And God gives him this comforting promise. Don't worry, I'm still going to put you on trial in Rome. You're still going to stand trial. You're still going to stand before Caesar. In other words, here's the message. Paul, you're still going to get to share the gospel with the emperor of Rome. You're still going to get to tell your story. You're still going to get to share your faith. The angel says to Paul, God in his goodness has granted safety to everyone else sailing with you. Did you get that? Did you get that? Even though there's going to be a shipwreck, he says nobody's going to be lost, Paul, because of your faith. Now, I don't know what you're going through or what you've already gone through or what you're going to go through tomorrow, but we know that circumstances change suddenly. It will not change God's purpose for your life, regardless of what you're in or what you just came through or what you're going to face tomorrow. It will not change God's purpose for your life. God says, I'll fit that into your purpose too. Whatever comes your way, I'm going to take whatever's bad and turn it into something good. I'm going to take something that would normally break you and make it bless you. I'm going to open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing in the middle of what everybody else says is pain. I'm going to make it your miracle. I'm going to create a miracle in the middle of the mess. Just lean into faith and hold on. Hold on, amen. Number three, remember God's promises can be trusted. Paul says to the captain crew and the other prisoners on board, So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will all turn out just as God has promised. Paul's faith is not in the ship. It's not in the captain or the crew. Where is his faith? He said, I have faith in God that it will all turn out just as he promised. Then he adds, nevertheless, we're going to first be shipwrecked on some island. We're going to be shipwrecked. He says, God's going to take care of us. None of us are going to die But first, we are going to be shipwrecked on some island. Now, this is very important, and I don't want you to miss it. Notice this, if if you're, especially if you're here today and you're hurting, and maybe you didn't didn't cause the problem, but you're having to deal with the problem, right? Notice this if you're in a storm, even if the storm is not, not of your making. God has not promised to save your ship. He hasn't promised that. He has promised, however, to save you. He has promised to save you. You may lose the ship. Why? Because saving your stuff or saving your job or whatever else is is not nearly as important to our Creator as saving you. That's the priority here, that you be saved. At one point, the sailors tried to abandon the ship thinking their lifeboat would save them. Seriously, you guys getting this? They thought their lifeboat would save them. But Paul said, you'll all die unless you stay with the ship. So the soldiers cut the ropes and they let their lifeboat go. They finally listened to something he had to say. He says, if you put your trust in anything other than God to save you from this storm, you will surely be lost. He's saying, you better cut the lifeboat loose and push it away. Quit leaning on your, look, I said it in the first service. I got to push back on it. But now I'm all in. I got to say it again. When President Obama was, was in office, oh, he ain't going there. You're dead gum right, I'm going there. There was a, about half the Christian population in the United States that was just miserable, and about half of the Christian folk 
were just tickled pink. President Trump's in office about half, different half, different half, <laughs> clearly. About half the people are thrilled and the other half are just disgusted, right? You know why that you get so twisted about politics? Are you ready? It's because your hope is misplaced. You're fighting every day. You got some bit. You know why you're trying to manage something that you can't manage? You're trying to control something that God never intended for you to control. You're trying to, to work out an outcome that's satisfactory to you. I have never seen so many stupid Christian people in my life that thinks they can fix it on their own without God being in charge. You better, you better lay that stuff aside. I'm t- hey, I believe in voting and I believe in, you know, speaking the truth and love and all that goes with that. But let me tell you something. If you think that somebody in Washington, D.C. is going to fix the problem, you are definitely a person with your hope badly misplaced. And I bet you're wishing I hadn't gone there. But, you know, I threw it in the first service, so I had to do it again. And again, I have no idea where I'm at. <laughs> what are you putting your trust in? That's the question here. I can't help but notice that most people place their trust in things that have no eternal value. Your looks, your money, your academic ability, your athletic ability. Listen, you're putting your faith and trust in something that can be taken away from you and will ultimately be taken away from you. Anybody ever seen, uh, you know, people, man, I'm just getting myself, I'm digging a deep hole here. Anybody ever seen people, and I'm not going to look at nobody, I'm just going to look up. Do you know somebody that every day they get their camera out and they do this? (laughs) There's going to come a day they'll quit doing that stuff. You know why? Because beauty fades, and this is the result. (laughs) That's a fact, Jack. And you know what they're going to do? They're going to quit posting selfies every day because young people, they're pretty to look at. Someday you're going to look like this. If you put your faith... I used to be pretty. Don't laugh. I used to be pretty too. If you, thank you. If you put your faith and your trust in, in your looks, there will come a day that the only pictures you will post are of your grandchildren. I'm just saying. Because your looks are going to kind of drift away from you. What are you trusting to save you? What are you trusting to save you? Your good works, your nice personality. Listen, only Jesus can save you. But for Jesus to save you, you first got to cut your ties and quit trying to save yourself. You got to push that lifeboat. Whatever it is you're trusting in, you've got to push it away. The safest place to be is always right in the center of God's will. So today, I want to urge you to let go of anything and let go of everything that you think might be saving you and just lean in to faith in Jesus. Are you tracking? Lean into faith in Jesus Christ, the only true Savior. He's the only one. The Bible says this. When daylight came, the officer ordered those who could swim to jump overboard and swim to the island. The rest, apparently those who couldn't swim grabbed pieces of wood from the broken ship to float on. Watch this. It says, everyone made it safely to shore. Everyone made it safely to shore. Everybody on that ship was saved because of Paul. Listen, God wants to use you in the same way with the people in your life who are are facing insurmountable odds. They're in storms. There's a lot of tension. There's a lot of pain. There's a lot of turmoil. There are setbacks that they're dealing with. Their suffering right now is of epic proportions. Please hear me. You know, I, sometimes when I'm preaching something heavy, I'll cut up a little bit just to kind of lighten the mood in the room. It works for most of you. Some of you still had not cracked a smile. You've been here all, almost 45 minutes now. Here, here's what I want to tell you, and I want to challenge you. Listen, this is serious. I dare you, I dare you to let God use you. I dare you to let God use you. Why, preacher, what are you all about? What are you saying? I dare you to let God use you because if you will, if you'll let him use you to help people who are going through storms and setbacks and pain and heartbreak and heartache, all of that stuff, they can be saved because of your influence. A lot of you in this room are going to reach people I'll never reach. 
that would never give me an audience with them, that will never come sit in this room. But you have influence with people, and you've not taken a step yet to try to reach out and throw them a life jacket or, or, or try to pull them out of the harm's way that they're in. Listen, folks, I dare you to ask God to give you an open door to be a difference maker in somebody's life. And why not start this week? Why not just start this week and let, let's just make it happen? They can be saved because of your influence. They can. Listen, I'm almost done, but I, I know there are people in this room right now. You are dealing with tensions and problems and pressures that you didn't bring on yourself. You didn't cause the trouble that you're walking through right now. Somebody else brought it into your life. Somebody else's stupid decision, horrible choices have brought you unimaginable pain in some form and on some level. That's true of most people in this room. But I'm going to tell you this. You have a choice. How you handle this is up to you. You have a choice. You can be angry, and you can be fearful, and you can retaliate and rage on everybody around you. Did you see that scene? George Bailey, he, he grabbed Uncle Billy, and he stood him up, and he shook him, and he said, This is serious. He said, Your stupid mistake means bankruptcy, scandal, or prison. And he said, I'm not going to prison for you. This is on you. You ever had a family member that you just wanted to? Amen. Amen. Me and Brother G, the only real honest people in the room. Amen. We've all had people that we just wanted to shake some sense into them, right? Here's what I want to tell you about all that. Don't fight and feud and hold on to your anger until you're broken, busted, battered, and disgusted. It'll destroy you. It will absolutely eat up your life. You'll be drifting with no direction. Instead, refuse to give up. Refuse to give in to fear. And I'll leave you with this. Realize that God is with you even if you can't see Him for the storm. There's no sun, no moon, no stars. You're just in a totally dark place in your life. Maybe you can't even feel God right now, but please remember this. God's presence... God's promises, God's provision, God's power, God's peace. All of these things come when we trust His Son, Jesus Christ. Some of you need to say, I want the world to know that I'm putting my faith totally in Jesus. I'm going through some hard times, some setbacks. I'm going through some storms. My ship may be falling apart, but God has promised to save me. The ship may be lost. I may lose some stuff. But that has no eternal value. But he's promised me I'm going to reach the other side safely. He's going to make sure that I'm not lost. I will be saved, and I'm going to stand on that promise. Would you close your eyes with me, everybody in the room right now? And we do this quite often here at Cross Point Church. But I want you to pray a prayer with me, everybody. And for some of you, this is going to be the very first time, and you're brand new to this place. You don't know anything about it. You don't know if these people are credible or just crazy, and I understand all that. But God's been thumping your heart all throughout this this service today, maybe through the powerful worship we got to experience, or maybe just a spoken word. And God's been thumping your heart, and I'm going to ask you, please don't push away from that. Why don't you just accept the peace that Jesus came to provide? He came into a world that was full of chaos. There was a battle raging in Bethlehem and all around. But Jesus came to bring peace, and man, did he ever bring peace. And he's trying to bring that into your life. You don't know what to do, where to go, how to fix your problems, but I know the peace speaker. And he's ready, willing, and able to come into your life and help provide a miracle in the middle of this mess. So I'm going to ask you with your eyes closed and your heads bowed to just Pray this after me. Everybody in the room, you know how we do it here as an encouragement to those that may be praying this prayer for the very first time. Let's pray it out loud just like this. Jesus Christ, I open my life completely to you. I don't understand it all, but I want to know you. I want to learn to love you. I want to have a relationship with you. I don't want religion. I want you. I ask you to forgive my doubts, my fears, and all of my sins. I ask that you accept me into your family in Jesus' name. I want you to to just sit right where you are and hold on to that prayer for just a moment while I pray for everybody else in the room. 
Lord, many people are going through tough times right now in this room. I know some of the stories, but there's so many more that I don't know what they're facing and what they're dealing with. Some are having financial setbacks. Some are having health issues, setbacks, and some, who, who knows all the different things that they're having to deal with. Father, help us to not drift, to not discard what's important, to not walk away, to not disengage, to not give up hope. Lord, we want to hold on to hope. Help us, Father, to trust you to do things that only you can do. And God, we need to put our trust back in Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Because a lot of Christian folk, a lot of good Christian people have misplaced their hope. God, would you help them to see more clearly that you are our only solution. You're the only answer to the problems that we face. I ask you to bless each person who's inviting you into their lives today by the the authority, God, that you've granted to us as people of the Most High God who have Jesus Christ living in our hearts and living in our lives. I pull down every stronghold that the enemy has tried to erect in the minds of your people. And I pronounce boldly, defiantly, that the devil is a liar and he's a father of lies. He has no authority here. And I command you, Satan, to cease and desist in your demonic attacks against God's people. Father, they're going to rise above it. Somebody else, we may be dealing with the consequences of somebody else's problem that they brought into our lives, but we're going to stand strong and true, and we're going to put our hope where it belongs, in Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of the everlasting Father. And we give you the praise, honor, and glory for it, Lord. we're We're not trying to present a program here, God. We're trying to present a gospel message that has power to help broken, hurting people. Let us embrace it. Let us lean in. We give you the praise for it in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen.